Hello and welcome back to Glasgow Truth Group Radio. Today we'll be speaking to Aaron Franz, creator of the now famous Age of Transitions film and author of the book Revolve, Man's Scientific Rise to Godhood. We discuss the concept of transhumanism, converging technologies, and the ever-increasing technological revolution that we find ourselves in today. Okay, so we're here with Aaron Franz today, and um, I thought probably the best thing, again, to, to start the show with is just if, if Aaron can tell us a little bit about um, himself and, and where he's uh, come from and, and how he's got into this kind of material, just for the people who might not know. Sure. Um, well... My website's The Age of Transitions. Um, it's, uh, the website's name is the same as my documentary film, The Age of Transitions. Uh, that's probably what people know best of what I've put out there. It's just an hour-long uh, documentary about transhumanism, about singularity and uh, eugenics and the connections there. And uh, I've also got a book called Revolve that gets into these subjects as well, and that's on theageoftransitions.com. Before that, I mean, it's been uh, a lifelong journey, as it is with everybody else. I just uh, found myself face-to-face with this information, um, whatever you want to call the information, the truth movement or whatever. You know, there's so many different ways to label whatever this is that we're doing, but I found myself uh, really getting deep into this stuff about four years ago, and you know I've never turned back since, and it's been quite a journey, and I'm very excited to be here speaking with yourself because I know you're doing a very you're doing the same thing as as me as we all are, all the listeners too. Yeah, that's right. We've, we've obviously got a lot in common, and that's um, one of the reasons I was uh, really interested in to to talk to you about these kinds of things. Um, but perhaps for for people that don't. Um, don't know necessarily what transhuman is, transhumanism is, or maybe they've they've heard about it and they're, they're not really sure, um, you know, what it's all about and why we're talking about it. Do you think you could just give us a sort of a, in a nutshell, you know, kind of a quick rundown on, on what what transhumanism it transhumanism is and why it's um, why it's so important to talk about? Yes. Um, well, transhumanism is many things. The most uh, commonly accepted. Uh, definition of it now, the uh, mainstream definition is that it is all about the creation of things, high technologies such as artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, uh, developing life extension therapies, um, cybernetics, things like chips, uh, brain chips, of course, these sort of things, and how the creation of uh, those sorts of converging technologies um, would are, is beneficial, that we should be actively uh, creating these things and uh, applying them to our lives. And uh, the the transhumanist idea is that in doing this, this is the way to, uh, this is human progress. This is where we're going. This is the answer to evolution itself, actually. It's the way to take human evolution into human hands kind of expedite the slow natural process of evolution and put it on the fast track and with that uh, of, of course the idea of transhumanism it is not new and it, it comes out of uh, things like eugenics and even the idea of evolution is I mean there's there's so many concepts that this ties into but the the mainstream idea and and transhumanism is steadily going mainstream now is that it's all about these converging technologies and that we should basically become post-human beings by uh, becoming cybernetic organisms, putting all these technological upgrades, as they call them. Those are the words that they used to describe all these technologies as upgrades. So that's what that, that's what they think we should be doing to evolve our human species. Yeah, yeah. It's... Um... <clears throat> It's something you're seeing a lot of in in mainstream media at the moment. Um, I mean, I'm sure people have noticed that. Um, I mean, a lot of these big big budget films of the last maybe sort of ten, fifteen, twenty years have have been featured uh, have been featuring quite a, quite a heavy use of um, these concepts. You know, where man is merging with machine, or machine has overtaken man. Um, and they've they've been coming out in um, shows like Star Trek, you know, with the Borg. We've had you know Terminator Two and um, 
you know, there's been so many others. Like uh, more recently, we've we've had the Iron Man remakes, and then I mean, especially in the last kind of maybe maybe year to two years, there's been a huge kind of surge of films that have all featured this kind of human upgrade where humans take the next step and, and merge with machine and become Superman, you know? And um, a lot of this stuff I find tends to be directed towards towards the younger kids, you know, because a lot of these are kind of um, like uh, comic remakes and, um, and classic kind of hero movies, you know, Hollywood blockbuster hero movies. Um, so it, it seems as if they're, they're really trying to introduce these ideas to us um, in so many different areas um, in, in what's often referred to as predictive programming. Um, so, I mean, what would, you, what would you have to say about that? I mean, are there any sort of key movies that really stand out to you? Or how, where do you see this going? Yes, you're absolutely right in saying that there is a huge plethora of transhumanist-themed films at the moment. Of course, this isn't new. I mean, this is science fiction itself. But in the last couple of years, we have seen a big push, especially specifically with uh, transhuman technologies. We can see specific things being promoted in specific movies, like we've got artificial intelligence being promoted in films such as Eagle Eye, for instance. Um, yeah, yeah. Very, and and also the idea of like surveillance and government spying is very prevalent in that film and that film as with many many others about transhuman themes was produced uh with the help of the united states air force the military is very big in uh with their entertainment liaison offices in creating these films and you will find with the air force in particular that many um transhumanist themed films with artificial intelligence robots with uh, the AIs, especially AI and robots, it seems like the Air Force is big on uh, because they also made the Transformers films. And uh, again, with the comic book films, you mentioned comic books and they're making tons of them. You'll notice, too, that with uh, most of those films, they're actually about the military industrial complex. Like with Iron Man, it's the creation of like this... Uh, Superman well well, it's a guy who has a military industrial company and you know that suit is like you know his weapon basically and then he becomes a superhero through his uh, military creation etc 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 same thing with the Incredible Hulk it's you know they're doing genetic tests on this guy it's it's, um, again and they're they're quite overt with the military aspect of things and they even put things like uh like high tech weaponry, they put in that Hulk film. They put like uh, what was it, the sound cannons and things like that. So they put those elements in there as a bit of predictive programming, as I'm sure all of your listeners are aware of the idea of pre- predictive programming, because that's what these movies are. But with the predictive programming, it's working on multiple different levels all at once. It's promoting the military first of all. That's kind of the exoteric. Uh, predictive programming for people just to ramp up military service and then Mm -hmm. you also have the promotion of well their weaponry just to get you in line your mind in line with the fact that those things are real and if you see them in real life at some point um well don't be surprised you know we told you already and also predictive programming with transhumanist themes telling you that like look, you know, you're going to be interacting with machines soon, so we're going to be putting the main characters, uh, they're going to be machines, and you're going to see humans and machines basically falling in love on screen, and uh, the, you're seeing that over and over and over again now in movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, that's um, the big... The big um the whole point of uh, predictive programming is to to make the the public feel like basically that it's inevitable you know so when these things do come into public domain and we start kind of interacting with them or we start um you know seeing them in real life or, or what have you um the the idea of these films is to, is to just to introduce those concepts so that you know when this happens people have just assumed subconsciously that oh well you know it was inevitable you know we you know I, I guess it was only way it could have gone you know and um and of course um i think another interesting point um that you raised there is is the pentagon connection to hollywood um because um 
basically, if, if you're making a film uh, and um, <clears throat> you need, uh, you know, uh, military assistance with it for, uh, you know, for planes and guns and soldiers and advice on explosions or what have you, um, you have to contact the, the Pentagon Liaison Office or I think, what, did you say the Air Force? Or? Yeah, yeah, well, each specific branch of the military has their own entertainment liaison office, as does the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, and some other federal agencies. Yeah. That's right, because um, I think I think the basic um, the rules are there. As far as I understand them from kind of the the, the research I've done, is that um, if you if you want assistance from them, um, you you have to portray the film in a way that favors the military, or else you're getting nothing. You know, yeah. and uh, these guys will actually come and rewrite the script for you until they're satisfied that it portrays the mil- military and the military agenda in the most favorable favorable light possible. That's Is that right? A, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, they actually, they have the ability to rewrite the script. They have the ability to create characters. They have the ability to change the story to however they want. And they do admit to an extent that, you know, yeah, we're trying to um, promote our military agenda, which exoterically, again, is a good thing. You know, yeah, our military is... It's the whole same old thing with um, how they legitimate wars, you know, like, oh, we're out there doing a good thing. You know, we have to be in Iraq. We have to be in Afghanistan. We have to be in, what is it, 150 countries? Well, they barely ever tell you they're in that many countries. It's always a focus on one little country or another. But the truth is we're in the over, spread across the entire world. And the big propaganda push is to get us, the average people, to think that this is a good and wonderful thing and that we're... Uh, <laughs> enlightening the world that our military is some sort of in, enlightenment force to uh go bring democracy to the savages and whatnot so it's it's the same deal uh, with with films as well and yeah they get to they get to write in whatever they want <laughs> yeah yeah they, they really do um and obviously um we'll probably get into this a bit later on but um as we know uh most of this kind of uh you know, transhumanistic uh, te- technology. You know, the um, nanotechnology and biotechnology and, and and this kind of thing is coming from the military-industrial complex, isn't it? Yes, and that's a wonderful point, and that's one that I feel that that is kind of the issue when it comes to talking about these technologies, and it's the one that always gets marginalized, and it's the one that nobody wants to talk about. Like the official transhumanists, the ones who label themselves as such. They'll get up there and they'll talk about virtual ra- reality and artificial intelligence and life extension, how it's going it's the best thing ever, and how we have to do it. They'll they'll go on and on all day. They'll say they'll come up with all sorts of ideas and like basically sit up there and read you plots from science fiction films. Uh, it's it's the same thing. It's what they're doing. But when it comes to talking about uh, the military connection to these things, and even talking about narrow AI systems that are fully entrenched in uh, many different areas uh, from biological technology to uh, policing and um, surveillance and things like this. They, they won't talk about those things. They won't talk about like the real practical issues. They won't talk about um, the military industrial complex. They'll just talk about their little science fiction stories and say how wonderful it is all day and say that if you're opposed to it, you're just wacky and stupid and what what could you be thinking? This is and how could you even think that? So, yeah, that's a real issue we have to drive home. I was, I was going to ask you, Aaron, um, for, for our listeners out there that really don't know too much about transhumanism, um, what, why should they be concerned about um, the, the, the direction of where things are going? Why, why should it be a bad thing? Uh, well, we should be concerned because uh, transhuman technologies are being developed. And these things aren't, uh, they're not totally science fiction. I'm, they're being sold through science fiction, but at the same time, they are real. And there are many government to- documents that uh, detail this and talk about what should be done with them. And it's a real aspect of uh, where the world is going. Uh, this, this transhumanist agenda is uh, very much. A real thing, and um, we have to understand uh, what that means and where we're all going. So, I mean, it's fundamentally it's about the 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 alteration of our very genetics, of our very 
uh, essence, our, our, our humanness. It's, it's the changing of that, the uh, remodeling of that. And um, so <laughs> if that's going to happen, obviously we all have a vested interest in that. So th- this conversation has to has to be in the public and it has to be um, open and everybody has to really uh, be aware of what these issues um where they came from what they actually are what the real issues involved are and not be kind of uh, sidetracked by uh, fantastical speculation and things like that yeah yeah that's right because um the bottom line is that people aren't being told the real story about this are they because um basically what we're getting is we're getting pro-transhuman um material um through hollywood um, which is just advertised, or sorry, just presented to you as being, oh, it's part of the story, and you know, technology is moving along, and it's only natural that this would be included, and people don't really think about it too much, and it's all, you know, to to, uh, it's always to our benefit, it's always advantageous, you know, it, it always helps us save the day, or or be Superman, or live longer, or do amazing things in some virtual reality like uh, like Neo from the Matrix, um, but but what people aren't being told is where this technology is coming from. Um, who's funding it and um, and why uh, and I think those are the biggest questions that people have to ask because it's um, it's very easy to just dismiss people who are asking questions as Luddites or ultra conservatives or, or what have you um, but the the bottom line is that the, the real truth about this isn't is, it isn't being publicized we're basically just getting PR aren't we yeah absolutely it's public uh, relations all the way and uh one of the marks of public relations is carbon copy news stories. This is how public relations firms operate. They have their clients. They work on their clients' behalf. They write up basically uh, one general story that's um, beneficial to their client. In this case, let's say the client is, um, let's just say it's a company that wants to market uh, implantable brain chips. And so the PR company that's working for this uh, technology company will uh, see to it that they place this one article because all they have to do is write one article. They hand it out to different people that they know in different media outlets. So they'll hand it out to a newspaper. They'll hand it out to another newspaper, another one. They'll hand it out to a TV station. They'll hand it out to all these um, media people, which uh, they're friends with. That's how PR works. So you basically just have to write up one story and then hand it out uh, to a million different outlets, and then there you go. It's it's you're broadcasting your message, and um, you don't even have to overt overtly say, oh, like with the story, like oh, this company's so great, they're making a brain chip. I mean, they do have many stories like this, but sometimes like uh, it gets even more involved with that. Uh, we see the big transhuman and singularity sales pitch PR pieces now in the forms of Ray Kurzweil's singularity. You've probably mm. seen you've probably seen this news story somewhere. It's like in yeah. time, it's in yeah. on TV, it's it's everywhere. So it's what how PR works again is carbon copy news stories. They just they make one story, they go, okay, here it is, here's your outline. You can you can embellish it a little bit, but you know, this these are the points to hit. They send it out to all the media outlets and then Everybody in the world is now talking about uh, Ray Kurzweil's singularity because it's so intriguing and um, yeah, and it works. <laughs> That's how public relations works. And, and of course, he gets to um, show up on all these uh, talk shows, and, and he gets to be the big hero coming out on stage, and um, you know, the, the man of the future, you know, leading us all towards this utopia. And um, yeah, and there's not a lot of real discussion that ever goes on in these situations because. Um, Basically, you're looking at a guy who, um, in my opinion, has a rather large ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's always the case with these spokesmen. You just find some guy who like loves being in the spotlight and loves being the center of attention. Yeah. And you can just like throw uh, the work of thousands, if not millions, of people onto this guy and like, look, this is his idea. Like, give me yeah. a break. Like, his, he's like the one guy that's making this happen. Come on. That's he not how the, the world works. He can be the front man for it all. Yeah. 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 It's amazing, isn't it? it really is. Yeah, yeah so, <clears throat> obviously, um, 
basically what we're seeing is is just um, is pro 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 transhumanism um, from wall to wall. You know, um, there is very little um, real discussion on what the the pros and cons are. And of course, when these people do their PR stories, um, one thing that they'll often do, uh, I've noticed, is that they'll they'll have a little devil's advocate line somewhere in the middle, um, where it's kind of a, to appease the the suspicious people, and um, it'll just be some like some really um, some really weak little stab at a possible problem with it, yeah. and then it'll be appeased by. Uh, but experts say, you know, yeah. yeah. But experts say actually it's it's going to be okay, and the the benefits outweigh the risks, and um, so so it's incredible what can be done um, by by a mission, isn't it? In, in this way, how um, all the all the possible pos- positives of this thing just get promoted through the roof. Um, you know, talk, especially in terms of um, you know um, giving sight to the blind, you know, and that and that kind of thing. It's always marketed in that way, and then um, any possible problems are always just explained away by the the, the Ray Kurzweil figure, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a key aspect of the formula of public relations that, uh, yeah, you have to, um, because all these technologies are innately um, dangerous in many ways, and and the normal person can pick up on that, and uh, you have to appease them, be like, it's all right, it's all right. And it's also the creation of, overall with these uh, PR pieces, it's the creation of this feeling of inevitability in that whether it's good or bad like you can't even stop it anyway like it's just progress it's just science Mm -hmm. like well we started science a long time ago we can't just stop it now (laughs) i mean like like this is the only way we can go so definitely the creation of this feeling of inevitability is uh Mm -hmm. key yeah yeah um and another thing which i always find interesting and i think it's something you brought up uh, on a previous talk um was that how, the, the way that this predictive programming works um, is that they will, as you say, surround us with it and engulf us with it to the point where we've subconsciously and consciously grown to believe that it's absolutely inevitable. Um, but people will notice that if you look at when this stuff was kind of first being bought into the mainstream um, through things like Star Trek and Terminator, um, that it was kind of a hellish situation, you know, it was kind of a nightmare situation of like technology out of control, completely dehumanized, really horrible, everyone hated it, you know, um, but, and you'd wonder, you'd wonder why would they be doing that? If they're trying to promote this technology, then why are they making it out to be so negative and scary um, in the films that they're funding? And one interesting point that you've brought up would be, uh, was that, um, the reason they have to do this is because it's something of a kind of like a cathartic release for the public mind in a way. They've got to play out the worst fears first. They've got to get it out of everybody's systems um, whilst at the same time making it seem inevitable so that when the time comes for this stuff to come out into the public, um, the debate has been channeled into a very small area. So everybody's kind of gotten over the fears and has realized that, oh, well, you know, um, if, if we don't have good AI, then we're going to have bad AI. So we better start making good AI to make sure that, that we don't have this Terminator 2 bog situation on our hands. What would you say? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's the way it works, absolutely. Because as, as we're saying, um, extremely intelligent AI systems that can self-replicate uh, or uh, brain chips, chips that we put in our brain, actual computer chips, uh, they have staggering implications that any human being that hears them at first is going to be scared of them. And so you you have to appease this fear. If if, if your agenda is to eventually like, okay, we, we're making these AIs, we're making these brain chips, we have to get people to accept them. Well, you have to deal with the fact that people are going to be uh, reluctant to accept these ideas and be like, no, that's, that sounds horrible. Like, what are, are you crazy? Like, are you a mad scientist? What's the deal here? So, mm-hmm. again, yeah, you make the film that uh, is the cathartic release, as you called it. And um, if we look at the Terminator series of films specifically, we can see this process um, quite clearly. You see the first Terminator film 
uh, the Terminator machine, Arnold Schwarzenegger, he's a terrible monster. It's a monster movie, and the monster is the AI machine. It just keeps coming. It keeps coming. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. It's going to kill you. And then at the end, they finally kill it, but then it comes back, <laughs> and it comes <laughs> back in the second film. And, uh, well, how, how does it come back in the second film? We find the exact same monster character is now the savior hero character. So, uh, psychologically, the way this works, we we have to break down these movies um, in terms of our own, how how we view them psychologically, like the psychological effect they have on yeah. us. So yeah. so so the the monster is no longer a monster; he's actually a hero, and that makes us go, "Oh, you know what? Like maybe maybe uh, but but we still have the evil AI, which is an even more advanced version, but the way to defeat it again is with good AI and this turns into the good AI versus bad AI. And the only answer then is not to completely ignore AI and say, you know what? Well, let's just forget that and let's develop some other kind of science. We don't really need AI anyway. The, the debate then becomes, well, how are we going to make good AI? Because AI could uh, clearly go bad and we have to make it. So we have to, and, and there are, there are specialists in this field of, uh, making a uh, benevolent AI that this is actually like a field within the AI research community and <laughs> making friendly AI. <laughs> so yeah. there you have it. There's another interesting concept in, um, or a theme rather in the Terminator two, um, is that, um, John Connor is, doesn't have a father in that film. The father isn't present. Mm-hmm. And so the, um, T what T 800 Schwarzenegger character, serves to be the father in that film so there's a lot of emotional triggering going on there for the child you know the child who's lost the father gets the father replaced by ai and so the bond is created you know absolutely yeah they play to our innate primitive uh drives and our survival instincts and what we are as humans like these these uh principles are well known and played to in film to again psychologically get the effect that they are going for yeah so the the machine becomes the father becomes part of the family so so you associate with it and and the father traditionally is the protector he's the guy who protects the family and the tribe and all that so you know oh, oh he's this this machine is now our protector yeah yeah that's right so um they they really are very good at this, aren't they? <laughs> they're, yeah, yeah, they are. Well, they're not afraid to tell you they're magicians, and they mean that. Yeah, they, they really are. Um, so obviously, we've talked a little bit about um, how transhumanism is being marketed um, and presented to us through all these films, and I'd like to get back to that in a bit more detail later on because it connects to so many other things. But um, for, for the meantime, I, I'd just like to talk a wee bit about the history of transhumanism because that's something that you've definitely brought out well in your film and in your book. Um, but for people who are listening and perhaps aren't familiar with um, either the film or the book or maybe they've not looked that deeply into this, can you just give us a little bit of the history of, of where transhumanism, tra- <laughs> transhumanism actually comes from? Um, because it's got quite a long history and it comes from a place... Uh, and a kind of group of ideologies that people might not suspect at first, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the history can be traced back to the really what the basic idea of transhumanism even is now, which is to take evolution, human evolution, into human hands and make it speed up. So that is the just looking at that aspect of transhumanism, we can go back in time to the idea of eugenics and again this has been said by many others as well uh sir julian huxley uh first director general of unesco was the man who coined transhumanism in its modern sense and he described it in this way he said uh he described it as man remaining man but using his intelligence to speed up evolution basically as something to that effect it was in his uh a piece that he wrote called New Bottles for New Wine. But of course, uh, Julian Huxley was an ardent uh, eugenicist, um, very high-level, uh, prominent eugenicist. He's gotten a long list of awards from all the eugenics societies. He's um, 
high-ranking member in many of them. Uh, and the, the idea of eugenics itself is uh, it's, it's about taking human evolution into human hands and speeding it up through uh, the under <laughs> what, what they believe is the understanding of genetics and um, of course with the, the old eugenic method is to breed um, certain people uh, with other certain people for specific reasons uh, for specific genetic traits that they have and doing this is a bit it's akin to breeding dogs which again julian huxley uh, writes about and many other eugenicists are they're always talking about breeding dogs and how uh, and there's so many points just with eugenics itself i could go on and on with like the little things they write in their books like oh yeah the civilized countries they're so good at um breeding dogs and the uncivilized countries don't and like and at the same time when they talk about breeding dogs they say uh they bring out the cruel and um very violent nature of the eugenic creed itself they're like oh yeah you just dispose of all the um uh the the runts of the litter basically yeah you, you get rid of those to perfect the type and and they just they just say this like oh yeah you you just uh, kill off all the useless ones when you're breeding the dogs, and then you get the perfect breed in the end. But it's totally ruthless, totally violent, total control freak mentality that doesn't even work out, doesn't even create evolution to begin with. It degenerates uh, gen- genetics, and this it's total control freak mentality that doesn't even work, but the being a control freak, they can... Uh, the control freak cannot admit that they are wrong, so they just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and the power of their will will never be. Uh, it will you you can never stop the power of their will because they honestly believe they're right because their eugenics again is a religion and this is a religious thing, and I don't know if I got to the tie to modern transhumanism there, but I, I I'm sure we could further dig into this <laughs> yeah yeah but um it's it's kind of a, it's a psychopathic mindset isn't it and um and if you look at eugenics um and the kind of people who are backing that and the kind of offices that they, that they held and the kind of influence that they had um the, this is a network that goes goes back um quite a long time and not only is it to do with eugenics but eugenics is essentially something that was kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It was kind of legitimized through Darwinism. You know, it had been around as kind of a, almost like a theology um, for, for, for a lot longer, but um, it was kind of legitimized and really brought, brought uh, forward um, and popularized um, through Darwin, wasn't it? And the idea of scientism is big in this too, science as religion, and um, very much yeah. so. Yeah, yeah, with Darwin... Even the family connections in the promotion of these ideas, we see the connection between the families with um, Galton, uh, Sir Francis Galton, um, advocating the idea of eugenics. He was the first one to uh, really like write the books and put the idea out there. Uh, he, he was uh, closely related to Charles Galton Darwin. I think they were like what second cousins or something. They're, they're cousins, I do believe. And mm-hmm. so it, that's all in the same family. And, of course, you have the Huxley uh, family involved in this. Once again, from the very beginning of uh, Darwinism, T.H. Huxley, Julian Huxley's father, was... Uh, not father, but grandfather, I'm sorry. He was Darwin's bulldog because he was the spokesman for Darwin and Darwinism. He was the guy there at the Royal Society saying, like, look, we got to get this idea through. And what you don't learn in history is that um popular history at least is that the reason that they had to push the idea of darwinism is because it's it, it's an agenda it's it's um agenda packaged as science and it is also a religion as we're saying too it's a religion and um now in modern day uh in a modern day sense to take it to where we are now darwinism and um genetics well, they've come a long way, but uh, now, now the idea of Darwinistic evolution is a religious idea to most people because you're like, oh, yeah, that's just true. Like, and that, that's that. It's like, oh, yeah, evolution, D- Darwinian evolution is a fact. 
and that's that's about it that's where the conversation goes with the, the average person you can't you can't say well you know what about this or like you know what about th-? you can't have a con- conversation about any intricacies or any details it's all just oh yeah yeah that's science so so they get us to believe that this is science and eugenics as well substantiated by darwinism science uh eugenics is pseudoscience so it's uh <laughs> legitimated yeah. by what we believe is science and at a time eugenics was totally mainstream in the 1920s there that all the major university genetics guys they were like oh yeah yeah they, they were espousing eugenics like oh yeah this is and and also the social aspects of eugenics they were kind of uh making this push for making it a political thing and politicizing their science their scientific religion it's so science religion politics it's all the same thing it's all about uh agendas it's all about putting your ideas out there and forcing people to just believe them and not question them not dissect the them as you should because that's what uh that's what a person who has critical thinking ability does you dissect things and go okay well you can't just come out here and flatly tell me that uh, this broad topic is just a uh, fact. You, 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 that's not that's not how things work. It's far more no, detailed no. than that. Yeah, um, but but that's what's happened. <laughs> um, it's, it's it's incredible how how eugenics and well not eugenics but Darwinism has been basically turned into a, an entire belief system just through repetition and through literature and through more repetition and through. Um, generational handing down of um, beliefs and ideologies to the point now where, I mean, it basically is an entire belief system. I mean, you can't have an argument with somebody about this because, oh, it's just true. As you say, it's it's just true. We all know that. It's common sense. It's common knowledge, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's amazing what you can do if you repeat something enough with the right authority figures. And, of course, you've had these people come out down through throughout the ages who have kind of been the scientific heroes. You know, you've had Darwin who was picked by the Royal Society to legitimize it and then you know today we've got the equivalent of him which is kind of like well we had Bertrand Russell as well and then of course there was we've got we've now got Richard Dawkins as well mm-hmm. and um, the, the, there's so many holes in what they're saying I mean, <laughs> these guys I mean the kind of the personality type you were describing before were just the, massive egos who could just yeah be, the, the, uh, the audacity of these guys just like yeah. declaring and saying i'm right i'm right and and then people actually sitting there and soaking it up saying he's right and then they're the the, the people's uh repeating what uh the guy in the podium saying are just uh expanding the problem like no he isn't right he's just saying something that he wants you to believe like nobody is right in everything that that's they're not taking into consideration the fact that subjective reality is um, is a powerful thing <laughs> and that at any given time you can make anything true in people's minds just by by uh, taking authority just by saying you have it. It's ridiculous. I was, I was going to say... Um... What you were saying there earlier on about the you know it being a, an agenda, <clears throat> it's um, it's amazing when you when you look at uh, how it's all structured. I mean, it's, it's so well coordinated what they're doing just now. Um, you know the sort of direction we're going in. Uh, when you look at um, you know the the media that we were talking about earlier on, uh, how you know it's so well coordinated through music videos, everything. I mean, uh, people are, are so well managed today that um, they, they, they are quite naive in the sense that um, they, they think they're going towards a sort of a benevolent utopia when uh, the, the establishment has sort of other plans, you know. Totally, yeah. And um, so, I mean, they have said in their the books, like um, there was one book, um, I can't, it escapes me now, but they, they were talking about how they wanted to perfect the the, the workforce and um, the, the the establishment themselves would sort of steer the ship. Uh, well, they would uh, perfect the, the workers below. Um, yeah. I, I just I find it amazing that the, the the way things are going just now. It is. It is, and like you pointed out, it's. Uh... The way to understand that this is an agenda, which it very much is, there are many different agendas that are actually all part of one agenda when you uh, connect the dots. 
it's it's what what we're do what we're doing what we have to do is actually connected dots that's what we uh have to do to counteract the uh the negative effects possible effects of these agendas actually going through we have to see that there are patterns and things and the patterns are the keys to the agendas. When you see something over and over and over again, you see the same themes pop up in films, the same ideas, the same even like corny slogans repeated in not just one place, but like in what uh, appear to be totally different avenues. Like you'll have a pop star up on stage uh, saying, you know, uh, we have to be green and reduce our carbon footprint. And then you see a, also a politician saying the same thing. We have to notice the patterns there and understand that, uh, you know, that nothing in this world happens in a vacuum and everything's interconnected. And yes, there are agendas and it behooves us to understand what they are, where they come from, um, what they mean, why they're being promoted. And yeah, that's that's what we're doing right now. Uh, I know it's, it's amazing what you're saying there uh, regarding the, the, the green agenda. Because um, the, the, the more you study this, you, you realise that there is definitely a connection between the, the green agenda and the transhumanism as well. Yeah, there really is. And, and again, that's a connection that most people wouldn't make. They'd be like, oh, yeah, uh, sustainable development, that's one thing. Uh, high technology, that's another. But they, they go together uh, quite neatly. And again, spokespeople like Ray Kurzweil get up there and they, they talk about how... Uh, we have nano enhanced solar panels and that's going to save the earth and all this. And so that's one aspect. And you also have the government documents that get into converging technologies, literally saying like, this is the way that we're going to save the earth. We're going to do it with these, um, converging technologies. So, so we, we have to, that's, uh, that's just one aspect of what converging technology is going to be used for is, uh, sustainable development. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it really does. It, blew, it blows me away uh, just uh, thinking about it all. It really does. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's amazing because, again, uh, with the promotion of these things, you see it, it so sometimes they'll go as far to uh, promote all these ideas all in one thing. Like uh, th there's a festival coming up here in Santa Monica, California called the New World Fest. I th it was supposed to be in June. It's going to be in October now, I think. New, New World Fest, that's an interesting name to begin with, but it's more interesting to see what they're promoting at it. Number one, they're promoting the greening and sustainable development and all that. Uh, but they also mix in high technology in this, and they um, have even New Age spiritual stuff that they say they're going to have uh, things with that. And you'll see uh, spokespeople that... Uh, I at least for me, I've seen these same spokespeople pop up before. They're having Ed Begley Jr. Uh, do something there, and he's um, appeared at many transhuman events. He's a big kind of uh, celebrity. He's he's a celebrity voice that they use to promote transhumanism because he himself is into the idea. I mean, I'm sure he is. I, I don't doubt that, but uh, so, so I'm sure he'll be up there giving a transhumanist spiel at this New World Fest, but it's the mixing of new age spirituality, of the uh, green agenda, and of transhumanism all in one <laughs> one area. So, and, and yeah, it's, it's just amazing. We see this over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> it's amazing how well coordinated it is. Um, we look at these different areas, as you're saying, um, because there are so many different areas. Um, and when you see what's happening today with this big technological revolution and so many of these different um, agendas kind of being woven into this basic, basically eugenics uh, agenda, um, you, you know, you really realize that the, the groundwork for this was, was laid a long time ago, you know. Um, and I'm not sure if you've seen the documentary, uh, The Net. Um, it's called The Net and it's subtitled The Unabomber, LSD and the Internet. Um, it's basically a documentary, a German documentary about um, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and it goes to his past and his history and the kind of people that he was involved with and the ideas that were going around back in the 60s to do with cybernetics and, and LSD and, uh, and technology and, and how the military got involved. Um, 
um, when you really look at the, the technological setup that was, was going on back then, um, it, it makes you realize um, how well planned for it is. And one of the most interesting things um, when you look at Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, um, is that he's basically served as this kind of symbol for anti-technology. Um, he's kind of been a, a, the, the heroic martyr for these, um, these what do you, I'm not sure what you'd call them, but, you know, the, the ultra-conservative Luddite people, whoever yeah. they are. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's, it's almost as if they've deliberately created the dialectic um, in planning for what was coming, you know, because at this time when cybernetics was, was coming out and they, they realized that they were going to be building a World Wide Web where everything could be connected, and I'm sure some people realized ahead of time that this would eventually transform into the transhuman uh, technologies and there would eventually be um, the kind of technology we're seeing now. It's like they've actually created their own, um, their own enemy to, to basically make sure that the, the argument on transhumanism stays, you're either with it and you're pro and you support it and you don't question it, or you're a Unabomber, you know? Yes, absolutely. And that film, uh, The Net, is excellent. I did see an hour's worth of it. Um, is it longer than an hour? Because it ended abruptly. So, it's an, I think it's an hour and 45 minutes, maybe an hour and 50 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think the copy I have was just part of it, but it was amazing because it does a really good job connecting these dots that we're talking about and saying how... Like, you know, the uh, hippie movement, LSD, the military, uh, big universities, cybernetics, uh, and art, they all intertwine. And it's so good at depict depicting that because that's really how our world works. Like, it's not just like one, it's not all these separate things uh, working in their own little spheres, but rather it's all kind of like one symbiotic thing. And yeah. and again, with, with Ted Kaczynski, you're right. Um, he is definitely the symbol now he is a symbol for um just anti-technological society thought and um the big problem what they use him for is to totally throw out amazing intellectual arguments the likes of which uh are like Jackie Lowe's technological society the book i know that they've mentioned in news reports that Kaczynski loved that book he loved the technological society which is an amazing book so they get to throw uh, wonderful pieces like that wonderful social criticisms out the window because this guy did terrorist acts and so yeah again you also uh, link the idea of somebody who just questions technology to terrorism so we get the whole terrorism thing which terrorism links into this whole transhuman thing fundamentally as well so fundamental and people don't we could go on and on about how terrorism and national security and the like fits into this whole agenda and that that's something that people really they will never talk about they don't understand they don't want to talk about and it's very taboo and it's that's the real danger of where we're going is um, yeah. this whole security state they're building up that's right and um <clears throat> just interestingly on the note of um on, of how terrorism relates to transhumanism, um, you just reminded me of a film I saw recently called Source Code. Um, have you seen that? Source Code, no. Uh, yeah, yeah, I really recommend it. It's um, basically a film about um, a guy who is um, basically mortally wounded um, in Afghanistan flying a helicopter, and he is become is basically his his body and his mind become part of some heinous military experiment where his brain can be basically transported back in time or his consciousness rather can be transported back in time into uh the body of another person and he can inhibit that body and use it to do reconnaissance hmm. and um so there's a that basically he's sent back in time to try and prevent um a uh, a bomb blowing up on a train um, so it's all very modern. It's very up to date, um, and of course, um, the bomb is uh, turns. Um, sorry, there's a bit of a spoiler for people who haven't seen it. But the bomb turns out the bomber turns out to be um, this Ted Kaczynski type. You know, this guy makes a big speech about te how technology is destroying everything, and we need to we need to ruin things, and we need to bring everything down to ashes, and then start from scratch again because this world is hell. And um, he's kind of like a uh, a young white male as well. Um, yes, yes. Cool. So, uh, yeah. so 
Yeah, big key there, definitely. Um, and um, you know, that there's little snippets in the film about how this this terrorist was um, he he was known to be posting blogs and <laughs> criticizing the government. You know, oh, <laughs> so yeah. it's it's all in there. You know, it's it's really it's really all in there. It's a big big link to terrorism. I mean, um, I mean, as you say, we could go on about it for a long time, but I mean. I mean, what would you say are the kind of maybe the the, the few main links, um, the the few main connections that are really important? Sure. Well, um, the establishment of converging technologies, developing them and creating a transhumanized world even and a world where there's nanotechnology, uh, high nanotechnology used in medicine, in, um, well, every field of human existence. This creates a security risk, the creation of these um, technologies, because they're so powerful, they have the power in the wrong hands to create massive destruction. And so uh, we have set up a situation where a terrorist organization can easily cook up um, whatever, a biological weapon in their own basement or they can uh, they can steal somebody's identity, or they can hack into a brain chip, and um, you know it's all those evil hackers and terrorists organization. And with this, um, I mean that, that's just how it goes. If you develop these things, these threats exist. And the thing to understand about these threats is the uh, concept of false flag terrorism. How it is a fact of history. Um, governments use terrorism to uh, legitimate, uh, basically taking the freedom of the public away. So, in a world where you develop these technologies, I believe where it's going is um, the a government, an authoritarian government, can rise to power and legitimize itself as being the protector figure again this father figure like the terminator it begets gets to be the protector father figure because there's all this danger and we have to regulate everything and it's it's so funny the transhumanists think like it's gonna be some sort of libertarian uh, dream come true like oh we're gonna be so free and technology will allow us to do any anything no it won't because it'll all be controlled by the government be because of safety and security, because it's such a safety and security risk, you have to tightly regulate everything, regulate people's lives to the tiniest little degree because because these technologies become a part of their very biology. And so we get uh, we get an authoritarian government and, and that legitimizes itself as uh, providing safety and security. And that's a direct evolution out of where all the terror scaring, because all this false flag terrorism that's happened in our time, which is, that's exactly what it is. Let's call, call it for what it is. It's all leading up to that. And the technological agendas um, uh, feed into that in that way, because that's where they're going with all this. That's the direction. I mean, that's, that's it. I, I'm, I'm totally convinced of, of it myself. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be amazing to see the kinds of technology that they're going to be able to justify through this um, fake terrorist threat, um, mm -hmm. such as the the whole RFID thing, and um, you know um, the the biomimetics and the security cameras. Um, and I mean, they've even installed those in some airports in the U.S. now, where we've got um, these. Um, I think it's yeah, the biomimetic camera that will look at um, a person's body movements and maybe do like infrared on their heat and stuff like that. And it will actually um, run um, a probability analysis to determine whether that person um, is likely to commit a crime. <laughs> so it's kind of like minority report uh, pre-crime situation that's actually being rolled out um, at, uh, for real. You know, this this stuff's already here. And of course, it's, you know, to prevent terrorism, you know, so... You can get arrested for something you haven't done, you know? And they do mention this, these ideas specifically in government reports as well. They say that, um, th that they want to understand the motivations of people and of groups. There's, there's a section in that NBIC report that I get into in the, the Age of Transitions that gets into this specifically. But, yeah, they basically want to enact pre-crime through total knowledge, what they can claim as uh, knowledge, at least, of what somebody's going to do ahead of time. They're like, oh, we can tell that he's going to do something. But, but again, that's uh, taking authority where you can't, you cannot predict the future. You can pretend like you have some technology that allows you to do that, 
But at the end of the day, uh, it only operates because you're scaring everybody to death into uh, you're going off fear because like, oh, look, these terrorists are out there. We have to know what they're thinking ahead of time. And and that also means we have to monitor you because, uh, well, you know, anyone's a potential terrorist. You saw Ted Kaczynski. He was he was a uh, intelligent white man <laughs> that was, uh, uh, you know, he's an he went to college and totally unsuspecting, uh, or so it seems. So we have to watch everybody. We, we, we have to do it now. So, so uh, yeah, definitely. That's, that's what they want to do. And they put it in writing in these government reports. I mean, this is, this isn't me even saying this, like, uh, that's not my opinion saying, Oh yeah, this is, this is the agenda. It's, it's in the government documents. So, I mean, I, I, I have that specific one on my website if anybody cares to read it yeah no um we've both looked at that document obviously it's a really important one because it's um it does detail um exactly what capability they've got now um and where it could be going in the future and um if obviously the uh, the golden rule <clears throat> with um these people is that if they're talking about something now it means they've they probably did it 10 years ago yeah um, so what they've got now i mean it, it almost doesn't bear thinking about in a way. Uh, <clears throat> so just as we sort of um, begin to um, round things up for the first hour before we take our break, Aaron, um, I just wanted to um, get into a, a sort of a, a few questions about, I mean, if, if you wanted to just round up, what are the, the kind of maybe three or four key areas of transhumanistic technology that are most important. I mean, we've got, you know, we've got chips, we've got AI, um, and um, we've got a lot of sort of drugs as well. I mean, that drugs and pharma, pharmaceuticals play into this a lot too. Um, but I mean, what would you say are the, some of the main things that are of most concerning to us at the moment that are kind of being rolled out? I would say that AI is a big one because, again, it's very misunderstood um, so many narrow AI systems out there doing many tasks that uh, we that that we don't uh, we, we don't ever talk about. We don't we're not consciously aware of how many AI systems are at work in our world today and basically monitoring us. They are the surveillance systems, um, uh, the intelligence systems behind the surveillance systems to make uh, sense of massive amounts of data mined data. So that's a big one. And I would say, yeah, the, the idea of cybernetics is huge because, again, it, uh, this fits into medicine as well. Um, just the uh, implantation of technologies and, and the merging of um, genetics with machines. And uh, we, we can see this uh, being promoted very much now, and it is coming. And um it, it it will affect medicine, as I say, and uh, I don't know. They're they're also important. I, I guess virtual reality too, because we're already living within virtual reality, and we don't even realize it. It's just uh, with the transhuman idea, it's about perfecting the virtual reality we're already in, and kind of perpetuating it science in a scientific manner, uh, perpetuating a false reality. It, creating as an artist your idea of an idealized reality and perpetuating it indefinitely and um, kind of in a way forcing it on people with uh without not being to you're not totally being forceful in that the people actually enjoy uh accepting the false reality they, they enjoy living in there because they've been convinced that actual reality is sucks basically it's terrible <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's uh, things that we can all see if we're, you know, if we're watching what's what's happening outside the window. Yeah. Um, but obviously, we've got a lot more to get into, um, and there's a number of different things that um, we'd love to talk about in the next hour. But um, for now, we'll, we'll just take a quick break, and um, we'll see you on the other side. Yeah. 